arrow to the right of the microphone symbol in the box. So, Nicole, if you'd like to start. Uh, okay, we're on pause. Excellent. Uh, so, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 78th uh, monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable uh, Business Model Group. Uh, we are recording today's meeting, so uh, according to privacy regulations here at OCAD, uh, I have to ask that you leave if you do not wish to record it. Uh, so with, with that said, um, I have a, a, a few minutes of introductory slides, which most of you have seen before, but we have, a, uh, I think, at least one, one new person this month. So uh, bear with me while I uh, go through this for those of you who have seen it uh, uh, already. And um, then I will hand over to our speaker for this month, uh, Manuel, Manuel Rima uh, from Wilfrid Laurier University's Wiesman Center for Education, Research and Sustainability. Uh, who's uh, going to be talking this month to us about uh, cult cultures for sustainability, which is a topic that this group has been uh, interested in for uh, some some time. Okay, so uh, let me uh, use these slides. So the first thing we like to do is just do an acknowledgement of our, of our privilege from a social perspective. Obviously, we're a, a global group, so this is acknowledgement which, which comes from the Canadian uh, truth and reconciliation uh, uh, recommendation from the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation process has been generalized to work uh, for a global audience. So uh, we would like to acknowledge that wherever we are today, uh, this is sacred land on which each of us is privileged to be. Um, this land, the, the nearby lakes and sea, has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge, and tradition. Um, we are privileged to be the beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of seven generations to come and indeed beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honor and respect people's indigenous to your place, including, of course, for many of you, yourselves. Today, each place around the world is increasingly the home from peoples from across the world, and we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. So that's the, oh, okay. the, that, that's the, uh, the kind of social recognition. We're going to say who they are, should I? I can uh, certainly we want to do. acknowledge the uh, Mrs. R. But uh, here, us, uh, us here in Toronto, that will be Mrs. Sargent for the new credit, absolutely. We're, we're, we're now actually officially go by Mrs. Sargent on the credit. The credit, yes. And the, uh, uh, and the Haudenosaunee Confederation and uh, the Fisher Point School Treaty, which we are part of. Absolutely. And so, and, and before that, here on Wendat, and there have been people going back 15,000 years. But, but uh, so, and, and I wish we had some with us today. Yes, indeed, it would be. It would be. So we, we have started to engage with these people. So that this is a good, a good thing. Thank you, Peter, for modelling the, uh, the desired behaviour uh, in this place. And for well, naming our friends and, and, and naming our friends, absolutely. Uh, and uh, so I invite people elsewhere to to consider what the equivalent what equivalent uh, uh, acknowledgements would be in your places. Um, in terms of the place, by physically, uh, we're uh, in the building that you see in the photo here. We're not in the top part. We're down below, in the, just the far end of that, that building. Uh, that's where Peter and I are, and I'm hoping <coughs> more people will join us face to face. Um, and uh, so, what we like to do here is, is the biophysical recognition. So, you know where you are in terms of the watershed in which you are. In. Uh, and so, for us here in Toronto, uh, we're sitting on the edge of a watershed known by settlers as Russell Creek. Uh, we, they, we buried that to become a sewer in the mid 1870s. Um, I've been looking hard for the indigenous name of Russell Creek, but I have not yet managed to locate it. So if somebody can inform me on that, I would be grateful to, uh, to add that. Um, so just would like to ask you to think about where, where you are, which watershed you're in. And I know some of you in the past have uh, gone out and done that research and actually said it. So I, I'd invite you, if you do now know, uh, to uh, maybe put that into the chat, uh, which watershed you're in. And uh, of course, the delivery of this session is, is interdependent in important ways to, to this place. And one example of that, of course, is that our sewerage system is largely dependent on uh, the, uh, the gravity, uh, uh, gravity divided watershed. Um, and in, for those of you using Flourishing Business Canvas, of course, the watershed is a collection of biophysical stocks and solar powered ecosystem services, uh, which describe the broader set of interdependencies that we have with, with uh, our, our world. So that's a recognition of place. So uh, we are, I think now, just over 1,500 people globally uh, in this uh, uh, group. Obviously, many people don't get to the monthly meetings, but we do record in order to give uh, lots of people an opportunity to catch up with our materials afterwards. And of course, we have the 
all the recordings and presentations act as a resource for the community. Um, we believe we are the first or perhaps the only group taking action to undertake enterprise strategy and to do organizational design action research from a micro ecological economic perspective. So ecological economics of system thinking economists of which there are not enough. <laughs> uh, we use systemic design approaches. So that's the integration of system thinking and design thinking. Uh, there's nothing inherently systemic about design and there's nothing inherently designerly about system thinking. So we are explicitly integrating those two as our, as our methodology. Um, and um, unlike many action research groups, we, are, we do have a strong normative purpose, which you can summarize as, as saying we're looking to enable organizations to contribute to the possibility of flourishing for human and all other life on this planet, which is an idea inspired by John Ehrenfeld. And on the wiki, you'll actually find a page that describes um, many other compatible words and ideas. Um, and I just had the opportunity to add a couple of new definitions, um, not least of which is the one from Buckley Sequilla, uh, which uh, is, is particularly inspirational. Um, which actually, I will, I will sit by reading this right now, and since it's on my mind, I will just read this out because it's rather interesting. well inspiring. So, Buckley Sequilla said that the objective should be to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone, which is a pretty damn good definition of flourishing as far as I was concerned. So I've added it to the word. For its time. For its time, yes, that was, that was a, that yeah. wording was from the early 60s. It was, so we're more modest about the American. They didn't really think we knew what we did. That's right. Um, so, so we hope that uh, what, you're, what you're finding is that we get you uh, uh, and that this aligns very much with the way that you're thinking and the, the work that you're all trying to do. Uh, and so what we observe is that the members of this group put into practice and through their actual research the latest ideas uh, in all of these uh, spheres towards that goal. Uh, and so what this means is that together collectively we offer a global network of possibilities uh, for, for all of our members to further their education, to further their research and indeed to further their employment. Um, I won't go through the, the goals of the group in, in any detail uh, at this point, but just note that uh, the uh, wiki again has uh, some a summary of the streams of interest for this group, and we do try and moderate our LinkedIn community around those uh, those streams of interest and, and the projects uh, similar similarly. Uh, similarly, uh, we are also part of a growing planetary movement, so uh, our group and the community has ties to all of these things on the screen here and many more. Uh, beyond. Uh, many of these logos represent projects of members of our group, things like Future Fit, Reporting 3.0, uh, Lean for Flourishing, uh, Flourishing Enterprise Election Toolkit to, to mention just a, a refocus, uh, to mention just a few of those. Um, and of course, we are also very much in sync with and going beyond the UNSDP. So uh, as we all know, the UNSDP is approved by the General Assembly in 2015, but they are, uh, and, and almost certainly these are necessary, but they're clearly not sufficient because from an ecological economic perspective, there are actually contradictions in these goals and things that are actually not biophysically achievable. One of them, for example, would be sustaining economic growth goal, um, goal eight. Clearly, we can't have an unending economic growth on a finite planet. Uh, so we have, as I said, multiple projects of our members, including Future Fitting, Flourishing the Focus, Toolkit, Reporting 3.0, uh, and aim to flourish. And we've got a, two or three other projects in the wings, one on product design, another one on software tools that uh, are trying to get themselves off the ground. Again, notice uh, the group is, uh, 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 is um, it's the members of the group who do the projects. The projects are responsible for finding their own funding and other resources. Uh, hopefully this is something that we can change over time, but that's the way it is at the moment. And of course, we're part of a larger community. Uh, the uh, We have a, a, a foundational paper that uh, one of our founding members, uh, Florian Lubeck Freund, helped to write a couple of years ago, uh, trying to set out this field of sustainable business model research and calling out our group in particular, as mentioned in that uh, article. Uh, we've got the systemic design community, which is our sort of methodological, epistemological home, of which Peter is one of the founding uh, members of that. Uh, we have the International Conferences on New Business Models. Uh, the next iteration of that is in Berlin, which many of us will be at. Um, we have the Reporting 3.0 New Business Model Blueprint, which many of us helped develop uh, in 2016, 17, 18. Uh, and we have our blog, uh, Sustainable Business Models, also maintained by Florian, 
uh, and we also have the Institute for Evolutionary Leadership, which we're doing uh, work from a leadership perspective specifically around everything we're doing. Uh, we also have the B Corp, B Corp academic community, uh, both of whose founders are members of this group. Uh, and we also have the Canadian Academies for Sustainable Innovation, uh, who have uh, expressed an interest in and have participated in, in this group uh, to some extent. So that's the, 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 wider, uh, uh, the, the wider community, if you like. Uh, we've got a number of tools and methods that members of this group have helped develop. I won't go through these now, but uh, these are some of the key things that this group has developed and is bringing to the world. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we've got a number of other projects underway, and I'll just let people to read this uh, uh, offline, um, including one project, Manuel, on cultural business models, which I was hoping Doug works, who was the leader of that initiative, would be here to hear you today, but obviously not managed to make it. And then we have our monthly meetings uh, for all of us to share with each other what we're all doing. Uh, here's some recent examples of that, including the Manuel uh, presentation that he'll be giving today. Um, all the meetings are listed in the wiki and all of the uh, slides and recordings are available in our uh, Google Drive. And um, just quickly jumping in, I think Doug has joined us on the call now. Ah, he has, okay, perfect. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Um, I wasn't paying attention to the, who was joining the oh. Excellent. Um, and um, we're, we are, are seeking to get more people engaged uh, from a grad student and research perspective. Uh, and so uh, we've got a list of potential project ideas on the wiki, which uh, people can take a look at if they're looking for uh, areas which need work as far as we're concerned. Uh, this is also an opportunity for people to present research designs and get feedback, engage with the community. Uh, in their field work and to share final results uh, to accelerate, accelerate postgraduate employment. So lots of reasons for, for why researchers, both younger and established, uh, might wish to get uh, engaged. So with all of that said, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Manuel Rima, who is uh, our presenter this month. Uh, Manuel uh, is the uh, executive director of the Wiesman Center for Education and Research and Sustainability, Veris, uh, which is at the Wilfrid Laurier uh, uh, University, Wilfrid Laurier University, which is uh, about 120 kilometers uh, west of Toronto uh, in uh, Kitchener Waterloo. Um, and um, one of the reasons why we wanted Manuel to present to us today was because uh, about six months ago, through one of our members, Randy Saad, uh, we started to see that there was a massive set of synergies between the work that uh, the members of this group had been doing for the previous five or six years uh, and the work that the these. Uh, Centre for Education, Research and Sustainability was doing, um, particularly focused on around cultures of sustainability and indeed organisational cultures of sustainability. Um, and because of that um, uh, uh, potential synergy, um, we started to recognise that there was a, an opportunity for uh, Wilfred Laurier and Beres uh, to host um, the first node in the evolution of this community, uh, the, what we've been calling the Flourishing Enterprise Institute is the, the other logo there that's on, on the screen. So uh, today's uh, meeting is, a, is kind of a, we hope, the start of, of something big. Uh, we've already done some work with Manuel to rate to uh, apply for some funding to move the Institute idea forward in a very uh, formal and uh, explicit way. And today's meeting represents an opportunity for Manuel to meet us socially and for, uh, him to, uh, for, for us to meet him, for him to meet us. And, uh, uh, we, we hope over the coming months there will be an opportunity for Manuel to meet many of you um, uh, in person. Uh, Manuel's going to be in Europe uh, over the uh, late spring and early summer, uh, and uh, we're hoping that many members of the group will be able to meet Manuel and explore how uh, we might be able to start establishing the second, third, and fourth nodes in the Institute network uh, over time. So, with that introduction, uh, I'll hand it over to Manuel. Uh, Manuel, maybe just like so tell us whether you'd like it to take questions as we go along or through the chat, uh, and then I'm, uh, it's, it's uh, all over to you. Okay, thank you, Anthony, for the uh, introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon, morning, uh, lunchtime, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to share my screen now with you. And then I'm going to start presentation. Okay, can everybody uh, see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, culture of sustainability. Um, I'm going to use a specific case study that I've started to work on here in uh, the Waterloo context, which is the Evolve One building. But I, 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 I'm going to focus it a little bit more broadly than just this one uh, case study. Um, and just to um, maybe give you a little bit of a, a background about myself, um, I'm a psychologist by training and I'm specifically in a field called community psychology. And I'll talk a little bit later uh, about that field um, because I think it explains a little bit um, of the kind of thinking uh, that I bring to this. Um, and I've been interested in sustainability for um, kind of 13 years now, um, specifically. Um, as a um, kind of response to the inconvenient truth when I saw that in 2006. Um, and then following that, I became engaged with Al Gore uh, to give his, his presentation in Nashville, um, where I was at that time. And the rest is kind of history. Um, I, I incorporated more and more environmental aspects or sustainability aspects into my research. Um, and now I'm focusing it mostly around this question of how do we create cultures of sustainability. Um, I wanted to start with this uh, quote by Caldwell. Um, the environmental crisis is an outward manifestation of a crisis of mind and spirit. And I think that especially the this, this second part, the spirit, is really important and something that we have not paid enough attention uh, to. A lot of the uh, approaches in sustainability are rather rational when um, engagement happens often, often at a more um, emotional level. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go on. And so you can read the rest of the quote yourself, but um, it is really ultimately about the kind of creatures we are and what we must become in order to survive. It's really a human crisis. Many people have said that. Um, and that's where psychologists um, become relevant because um, we are interested in how we can work with humans um, in creating change. Um, so uh, here's the structure of, of what I'm going to talk about. And generally, I think just in terms of, of keeping with time, if you're okay with that, I will just kind of um, go through the presentation. I hope to finish that within about 40 minutes or so. And then hopefully that will leave us with enough time for question and discussion. I'm very interested in engaging with you on, on this. Uh, my experience with, with people like Anthony and, and Peter and, and Randy has been that there's a lot of connection points, um, a lot of overlap also in values. Um, and so this is a, but we're coming from slightly different angles to the same issue. And so that's really exciting and interesting and, and stimulating. So uh, hopefully we'll have you know, a similar experience here today. So I'm gonna start um, kind of with my, my journey to why I came to this question um, on the importance of culture, um, then talk a little bit about culture of sustainability, introduce a little bit my field of community psychology, and then talk a little bit about the, the kind of approach to engagement that we have, our engagement strategy that we're using to um, create a culture of sustainability in the Evolve One building. Um, and then talk a little bit about our research, um, how we're evaluating it and how we're um, trying to understand the interaction between the building and the people and the creation of a culture over time. Um, and then um, that's kind of the transition to engaging in a conversation with you by kind of trying to create some connections to um, what you're interested in. Um, so just like there are many pathways to Rome, uh, there's also many ways of how he became interested in culture. And I'm just going to talk uh, uh, about uh, these um, a little bit because um, it might give you some sense of um, why I think culture is important and you might share some of these. But I came actually from multiple angles into it. The first one is behavior change. Um, so Naturally, as a psychologist, um, if you look at the, the literature on sustainability, 
most of it is around how we can get people to do the things that we want to do that we know, you know, are right. How do we nudge them into the right behavior? Um, there, there's two um, challenges that I have with that, or two reasons why I came uh, to think more about culture. Two typical um, theories I have listed here, you have might have heard of them before, a theory of planned behavior and the values beliefs norm theory. Um, one of the issues is that these um, behavior change theories are typically focused on one behavior at a time. And um, well, there are some advantages of doing that because a lot of the barriers that um, people experience are very, you know, specific to that one behavior, the same things with motivation. Um, however, there is a lot of behaviors that are related to our environmental impact and to sustainability. Um, so I don't think we really have the resources to um, try to create individual behavior change um, approaches to for each of all these individual behaviors and the other problem is that um, what is the, the right sustainable behavior can easily change over time for example one of the um, behaviors that has been um, researched a lot within psychology is recycling um, but now you know we, we're getting a little bit more understanding that there are real limitations to recycling and that it's not really the the best um, thing that we should promote and so now we have to reinvest a whole nother you know few decades of getting people to to adopt other behaviors so um, and then within an organizational context for example um, people move on so if you spend a lot of effort of changing one specific behavior for the employees at that time and then you have a high turnover rate right? like the organizations that we work with um, then all of that effort is, is, is lost to some degree, unless you are able to, to somehow create a culture in that process that remains within the organization that new people who come into the organization get acculturated into. Um, and then also, if you look at these behavior change theories, they always kind of start on the left side um, with Okay, if, you ha if people have the values, if people have the norms, if the social norms exist, then they will all, you know, then they will create the motivation, the intention to do something. But there's very little that is being said about, so where are these values and these norms coming from in the first place? And so that, you know, got me interested in, in that side and, and how do we actually create changes in that? So that's from the behavior change side. Um, I've been very interested in youth engagement, have done uh, quite a bit of research in that area. And one thing that I noticed um, in working with youth is um, when they became most engaged were when we um, focus on topics that have a strong emotional connection, um, especially around environmental injustice. Um, in our Canadian context, for example, I brought in a speaker um, from the Amjuwang community in Sarnia in Chemical Valley, which is uh, one of the most polluted areas in North America. Um, and this is a small indigenous community right in the middle of these uh, petrochemical industries. Um, and she speaks, you know, very direct and firsthand about um, her experience living there um, and, and all the kinds of environmental injustices that her community experienced. And, I've never seen such a shift in people's um, views and engagement as I have after we had that session. Um, and so th I, I think that this emotional connection to the topic um, is, is really important. I think that that is what we find with, with culture, that kind of that spiritual element that I talked about at the very beginning. So that's another pathway into culture. Um, I also was you know, really interested in social change movements because ultimately we need to go through a major change. So it makes sense, you know, look at, let's look at um, past um, big social change processes. And in the literature, in the research on social change movements, um, 
it's, it's clearly a recognition that you know each movement is is unique. This is this is a slide from you know several years ago when I presented on this, but. Um, there, there are two aspects that, that I saw that connect also to culture here. Um, one is that they talked about the, 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 the cultural political opportunities need to be there. Social change only happens in the right moments when, when the, the ground is right in a way. So there needs to be a, a cultural readiness in a way for engaging in these major uh, uh, social changes. Um, and then there's also this aspect of these social change movements are informal interactive networks that somehow need to be held together through, for example, a collective identity, which is often connected to cultural elements like uh, songs or uh, artwork or um, you know, different ideas of how we represent ourselves. Um, and, and so those are cultural aspects as, as well. Um, and so um, that was another indicator of that it's really important to pay attention to culture and work with cultural elements. Um, I've been working in organizational change um, for a while as a graduate student in, in, in the US, for example. I was involved in um, trying to, to shift a large mental health organization that operated in almost all of the states in the US um, from a, a more in, into it, intuitive based decision making to a data driven um, decision making. And so that was a, a huge shift in the way that uh, these clinicians were working. Um, and so I was very interested in how do you create organizational change? It's a massive change that we were trying to to create, and um, one quote I think represents uh, some of the things that I that I learned pretty well, and that's uh, this quote by Henry Mintzberg is I think of an organization structure as a skeleton, but uh, and culture is the soul that holds the things together and gives it life force. So there there is something intangible like a culture um, that is really important, and I saw that for example in the literature on organizational readiness. Uh, they're emphasized a lot, climate and culture, um, and that there needs to be the right culture in place for you to even be able to create any changes. Um, and, and there's also, um, for example, in the, in, in the work of Peter Senger that probably most of you are familiar with, um, is there uh, the, 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 the process is kind of emerging that organizational change um, it's, it's not often something that you can just say, not now do this or just mandate it from above, but uh, you need to just kind of create the conditions that then move people um, through, through the, these kind of changes. Um, and this is kind of represented in this quote here by Peter Sanger. Um, in the context of policy change, I was editing a special issue in our main journal, American Journal of Community Psychology on um, global climate change. And there was one group of authors from, from Portugal who are looking at the Agenda 21 and the implementation of that. And um, they, um, they, were, they were founding in their work that um, for policy to really work, um, that there needs to kind of go, a cultural shift to go with it and that we have paid too little attention of, of how to create that. We just put the policy in place, but we pay too little attention of how to implement that policy and how to create that cultural shift that kind of has to go with it. So that's just another uh, indication of the importance of culture. And I know that a lot of you are interested in transition management. It's a, a big thing in, in, in Europe, especially in the Netherlands. Um, and um, I, I saw a really interesting paper by Daniel Scholten that maybe a lot of you are familiar with. Um, he kind of evaluated the, the movement a little bit and um, he, he came to uh, kind of the, the conclusion, as you can see in these two quotes, um, that this aspect, the, the social and behavioral change aspect and the cultural aspect had been uh, neglected in the transition management uh, literature. I mean, if you go back to the literature, like Robach, for example, 
you clearly see a recognition that it's an important thing, but in the actual kind of implementation of it, it, it was not um, paid enough attention to. So um, again, another avenue into thinking about why culture is important and kind of related to that in terms of technological change. And this is my transition to the Used. But then um, if, if the cultural changes don't go along with it, um, that we're actually not accomplishing fully what we were hoping for. Um, there's, a, there's a great graph that I often show my students uh, on the development of um, cars, for example. We have greatly improved uh, efficiency of cars, but at the same time, a lot more cars were put on the road um, and a lot more people were driving more. So, um, and I was confronted with this in the context of this project, Evolve One, where um, they, what, what they found was highly sustainable building. So Evolve One is kind of this first net positive energy and carbon neutral multi-tenant office building that is commercial. Um, and the, the group who, who developed it, which is an interesting uh, group of a nonprofit organization, a developer, um, a university, and um, um, a, a company that is actually moved in there, um, an accounting company. Um, they, they were looking at some other examples, and what they saw in the literature and people that they talked to was uh, what was called the performance gap. And so that was that these buildings were built to perform at a certain level, but when you looked at the, the actual performance, they, they were just not living up to those expectations. And um, one factor in that that has been identified as part of the problem is the people in the building. Uh, this is both the manager as well as the, what we call the building citizens, the, the people who are working in the building. Um, and so that's, that's uh, where this group approached me as a psychologist and um, said, can you work with us on um, of getting this right so that we don't have this performance gap? How, how can we uh, work with the, with the people in the building? And um, I, I believe uh, what they were looking for is creating a, a culture of sustainability in the building that goes along with the technological advances of this building. Um, and so this is a, a multi-tenant office building that has about 100,000 square feet, which I think is about 9,400 square meters. Um, and um, it has multiple tenants. There's a accounting company, there's a tech company in there. And there's also an innovation hub in there called Evolve Green, um, which is an innovation hub for the clean economy in Canada. And uh, the Research Center, which is the Wiesman Center for Engagement and Research and Sustainability, um, is located within um, that innovation hub. Um, and finally, um, I've been also been very interested in system change, especially in the context of uh, this, this building. Uh, here you see our model that, um, we based it a lot on, on some work by, by Foster Fishman and colleagues, um, but it, it, it integrates a system dynamic modeling and basic system theory that um, most of you are using in your work. Um, but in, in terms of key elements of the system, uh, they describe these, these four elements that you see here in the, in the, in the middle. The, is the, the leadership, the operation management, which is a lot where, where you operate with, with your work, um, the, the regulations that exist, the policies, the resources, but then really important, the culture, uh, the norms, the values that exist within the system. Um, and so this is, this is what we're trying to focus on with our work. So the question is, how, how do you affect or how do you create that culture of sustainability? And um, we had a very um, unique opportunity here because we were working with this building before people started moving in. So we were able to uh, talk to these companies, talk to the employees um, before they were moving into the building in our pre-occupancy assessment. And then um, 
again, now we are actually with them in the building. We are one of the tenants. We, we do participatory observations there. We work closely with them and we can see this culture emerging, but we also very actively our um, fostering it. Um, we have a manager of culture of sustainability that we hired uh, to specifically work on it. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. Anyway, so those are my many ways of why I, uh, how I came to culture and why I think culture is really important. No matter if you come more from the psychological side, you come more from the system side, from the uh, organizational side, uh, you eventually, I think, going to end up there. And so, but in all of these contexts, um, there was a recognition that we need to do more work on figuring out of, of how to work with culture and how to uh, maybe work on cultural changes. So that, that's, that's why I became interested in this. As a, I'm an empirical researcher, so I wanted to empirically research um, that phenomenon. Um, so in terms of... Uh, culture and sustainability, um, there's an interesting article um, by, that I found uh, on that topic um, by Paclin. And it's, it's kind of related to some, some stuff that Peter um, has also emphasized. Um, there is both a culture for sustainability. So we need to have um, a, a culture that supports the movement towards uh, to sustainability. It's, participatory, that is um, motivated, that is engaged in, in the topic, to even have the conversations that we need to have about what sustainability is and our vision, our shared vision that we're moving towards. Um, but then also we need to end up in a culture that is sustainable, so a culture of sustainability. Um, and and I, I, I very much um, agree with that kind of perspective that it's both in terms of a process um, that we need to have to support our work in moving people towards sustainability, but then also a vision that we're working towards um, of, of what needs to be created. And um, in, in when we talk about culture, there is this more kind of tangible stuff that we often talk about, like the traditional elements that make up cultural policy as, as in this quote, uh, theater, film, music, art, architecture, literature. And I think that those elements are also really important. It's not necessarily primarily what I'm talking about. I'm talking more about the, the anthropological and sociological concept of culture, but um, I do think, uh, in, in my experience, um, and especially in regard to working with emotions and emotional engagement, uh, that these other cultural elements um, are really important. And um, there has been some criticism that the sustainability movement has mostly instrumentalized art in terms of just you know, transferring their message and making their message more engaging, rather than to really work with art as as a um, as a mechanism or as a a way of thinking about um, you know visions, utopia about breaking through um, our ways of thinking and um, engaging people um, in a whole other uh, way. And I think we need to to think more about that. Um, but across you know, different bodies of literature, especially in the organizational cultural literature, what we found is um, that, it, that culture generally has like these two faces. One is a deeper underlying domain rooted in the collective health values, assumption and beliefs. Um, so this is the, you know, what, what brings us together, what, what do we value together? Um, and then those norms and values and beliefs manifest themselves in the way that the actors um, in that context um, are behaving and acting, um, their practices that they share, uh, often those practices are social practices, um, and um, also in terms of the, the language of people, uh, discourse that they use, and the, the, the symbols that we see um, around, like you, you can, in a, in a community where there's a strong culture of sustainability, there, there should be a lot of visual elements that, that give you clues that 
this culture exists. Uh, so it manifests itself in these very physical uh, ways. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of the, the understanding of culture of sustainability that we work with. And so culture here is then for the benefit of uh, environmental, social, and economic um, sustainability. So, you know, working with that traditional understanding of sustainability is more than just the environmental aspects. Um, and sometimes it's good to just have an example to describe what we mean. It's all great in theory, but um, I wanted to, to quickly bring that to life um, with an example. I don't know if you're familiar with the, with the Hillside Festival. It's a, a relatively local festival here in Guelph, um, just about 30 minutes away from, from Kitchener in Waterloo. Um, and it's one of the greenest festivals in the world. Um, and I, I shared with you here the, the vision. And if you read the vision, Hillside will create a more vibrant and caring world by promoting altruism, equality, environmentalism, and peacemaking in every aspect of its work. You wouldn't even guess that this might be a music festival um, that has this, this vision for themselves. And the, the, this vision is really shared among all of the people who work for the Hillside Festival and also the people who come to the festival. Um, and there's many things in every decision that they make, they consider these sustainability aspects. Uh, so for example, when, uh, you know, one of the biggest impacts as a music festival um, is the transport of the bands. And so they have given that a lot of thought and um, they, they bought a bunch of instruments so that the bands wouldn't have to travel um, with the instruments and can travel lighter. There's, they've also coordinated um, with other music festivals that are in um, relatively close proximity um, so that these bands can travel to multiple music festivals at once. And so that, that the longer distance travel is justified uh, that way. Um, they have a lot, hundreds and hundreds of volunteers uh, all of the dishes are being washed on site. The dishwashing tent is right next to the main stage so that the volunteers uh, can enjoy the music while they do the dishes. Um, all of the food is local vendors. There's even some of the stages are being powered by people pedaling on bikes to generate the energy for uh, the music system. So they really, really embrace uh, this idea and have deeply embedded sustainability in every aspect. They also have strong indigenous content um, and they leave the site completely clean. Often uh, they do more for this environment that they're in than they started with. Um, so to me, this is an organization that um, represents a culture of sustainability that has a culture of sustainability and you can see that um, when you go to the festival environmental and other sustainability aspects are all around are very present there's no doubt and as people join the festival um, they become acculturated into that um, they you know everybody brings their water bottle more and more people every year uh, come with their bikes even from you know quite a few distance um, so it's 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 a true culture of sustainability. I'm just checking out time. So okay. Um, so I hope I convinced you, and maybe I didn't need even to convince you that uh, culture of sustainability or culture generally is a really important aspect in our move towards a more sustainable world. Um, so then the big question is really, how do you create a culture of sustainability? And um, I put a big question mark in there because um, I don't think we have an answer. Um, and I I'm, I'm hope I don't disappoint you today if I, if I don't claim that I have an answer. Um, we are um, working on it and we, you know, trying empirically something out in this unique context that uh, we have. Um, but um, at this point, um, I, we, we, you know, we're still at the very beginning. But there's several challenges we are up against in, in regard to cultural sustainability. So if culture is really more like a soul of, our, of a human system, um, 
that, that is something relatively difficult to, to work with. We almost we need like maybe cultural theologians or um, you know, therapists um, to work with us um, on, on you know, working with this soul. Um, it also is um, a gestalt that um, emerges. It's, it's really hard to predict how it's going to look like or prescribe how it's going to look like. It is something that needs to be co-created um, with the actors um, in the context that you're working in. And um, it, it constantly needs to be co-created. So it's a process um, that is ongoing. Um, and I um, also think it, it relies heavily on an emotional engagement um, as related to our identities, to um, our, our connections to the issue beyond just a kind of a rational level. Um, and then another challenge is um, while we have cultural diversity often, um, often what we see is that uh, there is cultural domination where one culture tries to dominate um, other cultures. And I think that that can also be in the context of sustainability or sustain cultural sustainability. Um, so, you know, for example, um, the sustainability movement in the North American context has been incredibly white. Um, and what does that mean? And how does it feed into um, the way that we uh, think about sustainability? Um, so lots of challenges that we have with, but um, I think we all like a good challenge, so it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Um, so I can draw from my background in community psychology. Um, community psychology is a relatively small subfield of psychology and it kind of sits between um, psychology, social work, and sociology maybe, and a little bit of cultural anthropology. Um, because we, we are a very practice-oriented field, but we like research and theories. Um, we try to connect those and to develop a, a balance between those. Um, we also um, value base, and, and I saw that on, on Anthony's slide before, that you also really strongly claim this is a, a normative um, approach. And um, I completely agree, and uh, that's why I think you know, it was so easy for me to bring community psychology and sustainability together. Um, you know, some of our core values um, are social justice, um, respect for diversity, uh, well-being, um, thinking at ecological levels, um, and, and collaboration and engagement. So um, I think there's a lot of connection points there with, with your values. Um, or as Anthony just reminded me of our values since we're coming together as a group. Um, and um, the ecological perspective, thinking in multiple levels, thinking of people in context is very important uh, to community psychologists, kind of permeates everything that we do in, in the way we think, in the way that we develop intervention or prevention programs, in the way that we do our research. Um, and, and develop theories. Um, so system thinking is also very present. And again, I think that this is a connection point. One thing that we really emphasize more and more is the importance of att paying attention to power. Um, power is present in so many things, yet we often um, neglect to, to um, talk about it. It's kind of the elephant in the room. Um, and so in community psychology, we try to specifically pay attention to power. Uh, we often work with marginalized communities um, that, that motivates most of us. Um, and uh, some of our core concepts are empowerment, empowerment theory was uh, very big in community psychology and has kind of permeated out of there in other fields. Um, participation is really, and, and collaboration is, is emphasized a lot. Um, so I think you will find that there's a lot of overlap with sustainability science and uh, um, work. Um, so that's why I think it was so easy for us to um, I could talk more long more about community psychology. I think uh, it was, it's a really great field, but uh, I don't have the time today and I don't want to bore you. Um, so, um, 
I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about now about engagement. Uh, well, well, before you just move off community psychology, could, could, given that this group is interested in organization, can you just relate organization and community for us? Um, so I think community is a more general term um, with the idea that you can have communities within an organization, but you can also have communities at a neighborhood level. Uh, communities can also be virtual, um, like online communities, for example. Um, there's hundreds of different definitions of, of community and, you know, nobody really tries to, <laughs> to settle on one. But um, I think it's similar um, to the way that I explain it to my students is, um, you know, you have a group, but what makes a group a community? And I think it comes back to this idea of soul. There's something um, that, that develops um, that makes this group a community um, and, and that kind of sits above and beyond it um, and, and, and is being co-created by the members of, of, of these groups, um, but then also exists as an entity in and of itself um, that is, is um, both dependent and independent of, of the members of the group, which is a really interesting kind of process. And so um, because we're using an ecological model and, and we're using Bronson Brenner's kind of uh, take on it, um, the organizations kind of sit in the middle of the way that we, we, we think. Um, so we start with the individual, then kind of the relational level of, of family and friends, like the, your direct social uh, people. And then, um, and then you kind of go into organizations and from that into communities and then into the more broader cultural, political sphere. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question very well, but... Uh, uh, that, that, that's a good start. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. I have a quick question related to uh, culture and business model. Is that a good thing to bring up now or maybe at the end of the first? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go very much into a uh, business model. Um, and I'm hoping to have that more as a, as a conversation. I, I, I'm going to put that a little bit in your court to make the connections between what I'm presenting and, and business models, if that's OK. Uh, I, I've got a question. I'm going to jump in because I'm going to have to ring off at 2.30. This is Gil Friend in Berkeley. Um, th thanks for this. Um, the slide that you showed a few minutes ago of the um, creating a culture of sustainability uh, was very helpful. And I would have loved to have that at the beginning because uh, mm. I found myself wondering all the way through, what do you mean when you say culture? Mm. Um, and there are a lot of implications of what it meant, but it's a very, it's a very general and broadly defined and catch all kind of word. Different people mean different things by it. So I was kind of lost and that was, that slide was more helpful. So I would have loved that at the beginning. Um, the other question I have, and I'll have to figure out how to get an answer from you, is when you were talking about the, the building um, and the importance of the culture of sustainability and the behavior of the tenants, I would think that a building um, at its best should be automatic. I mean, normally when I walk into a building, I don't think about how I need to operate in the building. It does what it does. And I would imagine a net zero building should just do what it does without me having to fiddle or think or do anything it just you know it has automatic systems it gauges ambient environmental conditions internal environmental conditions and does what it needs to do so why is culture relevant for a net zero building yeah i mean for, for multiple reasons i think um one is for this performance gap that i was mentioning that um often but, but I would suggest that the performance gap is a design failure of the building, not a culture problem. Um, the building shouldn't depend on that. In, in theory, and, and since, you know, some of the earlier research that came out of it, there have definitely been attempts to improve on the technology and, and, and rely less and less on, on the people. But you're still going to have people in the building and the people can make a difference. Um, and there, there, there's mm -hmm. aspects that are related to the building, but not necessarily determined by the building. Um, so for, for example, one, one thing that we just recently um, conducted a, a waste audit. Um, and um, mm -hmm. 
even in our um, innovation hub, which is focused on the clean economy of Canada, um, the level of contamination um, in the waste stream, um, you know, yeah. we have four different um, kinds of, of waste boxes, um, what was surprisingly high. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so there, there, there is a part that, that the people play. And then the other thing is, and that, that's part of why I'm, why I'm interested in this, and, that, and I'm going to come to that in, in, the, uh, in the next part, um, is it is a great opportunity to engage people. Um, and there are certain things, um, like, for example, reducing meat consumption. If, relatively little to do with the building itself, but you yeah. can use um, the move into a green building as a spark for people to start thinking more about sustainability. And that's definitely something that we have seen. And so it's a great opportunity to start engaging people uh, more with the concept of sustainability um, because you need to have some sort of entry point and uh, into that conversation with people who normally don't think about it very much. Um, and, and so th they have seen that, for example, in research related to, to um, schools who moved into sustainable buildings, where um, they've often found that um, just moving into the, the building did relatively little um, in terms of changing attitudes or behavior among the students. Um, but when the building was used um, in the teaching and the teachers engaged the students with the building um, and there was you know, more focus on, on how to engage the students with it, um, mm. then they saw those changes in the students' attitudes mm -hmm. and behaviors. Um, and so, that's part of, of, of what we're looking at at this is um, a lot of the social practices and um, behaviors that we're looking at in, in regard to environmental sustainability are very habitual. And so they're very difficult to change. And often the best time to change them is when there is some sort of uh, disruption or some sort of relatively big change. And so moving into a green building or renovating a building to be green um, can be that kind of opportunity. Um, so I think it's both in terms of supporting the, the building. Um, yes, there's a lot of things that you can do um, just from the technolo technological side. Um, but again, you know, I look at our building and um, there is, um, there's compromises that you have to make with technology. Like we have automatic a light turn off and off, um, but you cannot build that too sensitive because you don't want to be in a situation where it's constantly turning off and off if you're in the building. Mm -hmm. um, so what I observe a lot is that when I leave, and I'm often the last one to leave, is um, that a lot of the lights are, are on, even so they could be off. Right, and then it, it, it really depends on people to turn the lights off. These are relatively minor things, but um, I think it all adds up. Um, and then you know, there's things like commuting to the building. Um, yeah. So, yes, if you look at purely, you know, in terms of the environmental impact of the building, um, you know, they, there's a lot that you can do with with technology, with limitations. Um, but there's a lot more. Um, you know, that we can promote in regard to sustainability. Yep, that's a great discussion. I think we, uh, I don't know if you want to have points of discussion here and bring it forward at, you know, at the end too, but I would just add uh, with, you know, uh, to, to that, that with any, with any uh, construction of buildings, especially, I think we need to look more at aesthetics, symbolism, language, engagement, and the forms of culture in in uh, in advanced technological or so-called green buildings that we're that we are creating, so uh, artists like um, uh, Wunderwasser in the '60s developed fully integrated, highly aesthetic, you know, first green roofs, embedded buildings that told a story. And I don't think that we're there yet with the built environment. 
So there's a huge opportunity for, for the emotional engagement of of the of people in their buildings. We're still in this kind of modernist technological phase, I think. So I think this type of research is going to be necessary to actually push the technology into um, you know the aesthetics of of the new values. And it, there, there's some really interesting interactions, I think, too, in terms of building design and thinking about cultural sustainability. Um, one thing that, we, that we're finding is to engage people and challenge people um, around the topic of sustainability, you need to have a level of trust with each other and you need to have a, a sense of community. If I look at you know, my, my setup here in my main office at Laurier, um, it's not built. There is no space for us in our department to easily engage with each other. Um, you know, we have our microwave in the, in, in the mail room um, and there's no space for anybody to sit and share a meal, for example. In, in um, the Evolve One building where, where my other office is, our research center is there, it's a huge kitchen area, um, lots of space, um, different kind. We, we actually researching that. We create a different kind of um, collaborative spaces to see what kind of setups people tend to go to and, and for what purposes. Um, and, and just having that space for community building um, makes a huge difference in, in us meeting other people in the building, having these conversations around sustainability um, that then you know, impact things in, in, in different ways. Um, so I think there is, there's you know, really interesting complex kind of interaction between how the building is designed and how it might foster um, sustainability. There, there's you know, basic psychological stuff that you can build into the building design as well, so when we worked with the design team before the building was built in, in the design process, um, you know, we looked at things like where the stairs are, stairs are located and a lot of office buildings here that I've seen, uh, the stairs are kind of to the side, often pretty shady and dirty and whatever, so nobody wants to take the stairs. So in this building, um, the stairs are very central, um, go up alongside a beautiful green wall um, and a bright yellow. So there's no doubt, you know, in terms of what people are encouraged to take. Um, anyway, but that's more basic psychological stuff. Um, maybe I, I, I go on and then we can re-engage in, in some of these conversation um, as I talk a little bit about our process of what we're actually doing and some of our research. And uh, just a quick question. So this goes till six? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so I'll, I'll speed up so that we have some time left. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Peter Sanger is, is this one, that people don't resist change, they resist being changed. I found that to be true uh, many times. Um, and, and so you cannot engage somebody um, who has not some sort of initial interest um, to be engaged. Um, and that, that's something really important. Like in a lot of psychological work is very manipulative and try to push people um, against, you know, sometimes their conscious will. Um, and, and, and engagement to me doesn't work that way. Um, in looking at the, the civic engagement literature and, and also workplace engagement literature, um, what you find overlapping is that there's typically these three dimensions um, of engagement. There's the cognitive, the emotional, and the behavioral or action, engagement and action, and they're kind of, ideally, if you want to fully engage a person, um, you meet all three, meet them at all three dimensions. Um, and so, what we found through, through some of our engagement research um, is, is, is this kind of process, and that's, that's what we're testing right now in um, the context of uh, our current project is we need to have some sort of spark to, to get the people's attention. And so that's just where I brought the example that moving into a sustainable building can be that spark where people suddenly think, okay, maybe 
maybe I should think a little bit more about sustainability. At least they might show up for initial meetings. So one thing that we did is um, we held three workshops um, with representatives from each organization that is in the building. Um, and we, we sold it mostly as, you know, meet other people from the building, but we also were able to engage them in this, in this issue of sustainability. And then um, you try to, to find ways of engaging them in, in all three dimensions, as I mentioned, um, which creates kind of the motivation ongoing and that then needs to be channeled uh, somehow into a specific action. I'm very interested in action rather than behavior. I think a lot of, a lot of the, the problems are not within individuals, but they are within the systems that we have created. Um, and we need policy changes and infrastructure changes. It's much more effective to um, you know, change bike lanes rather than trying to motivate people to bike when, when biking is not safe. Um, so um, that's why I think we need to, to really think about how do we engage people in action rather than trying to change uh, their behaviors. The behavior change will follow. Um, and then um, it, it's a social process. So once you have some individuals that are starting to act in a different way and are interested in these issues, then you, you often see um, this kind of ripple effect. And, and you know, there's other models that, that have, you know, said Rogers diffusion of innovation model, for example, um, speaks to that as well, that you, you know, you often start with a few individuals and then it kind of ripples out from there. And we have found that in our own research with youth, for example. Um, so then in terms of making this a little bit more concrete, we have uh, rather than a prescriptive strategy, we have uh, specific guiding principles um, and uh, our manager of cultural sustainability is trying to implement these in different ways. Um, we co-creating the actual engagement strategy with the tenants of the building. Um, we developing goals of where we want to start. And we're using uh, design processes in that. We're working with uh, my colleague, Sean Gobi, um, who does a lot of social innovation and design thinking. Um, and so we did a series of workshops where we came up with these um, three prototypes, um, which are little experiments of, of actions that they're taking now. And we're gonna try this out for a couple of months and then come back together, evaluate that, and then see how we're gonna expand from that. Um, and you, you see here on the right, there's a, a lot of different um, strategies that we're using in that. We, we, we did an extensive kind of readiness assessment to understand each organization and see where they're at. Um, we, we work with leadership and make sure that they communicate things. Um, we have our manager, there need to be devoted resources and time to do this kind of work. Um, I mentioned participatory. Um, we are working on uh, regular feedback on different indicators, um, celebrate success, making it fun, and so on and so on. Um, and so these are, you know, more general strategies that then get implemented into specific actions that the group is taking together. And so um, to be able to research this and show, you know, hopefully that it works and how it works and how we can improve it, um, we were lucky to, to, to get a bit of uh, research funding um, from both uh, regional, provincial and federal levels. Um, and so we turned the whole building into a living lab all of the tenant organizations have agreed to participate in this research. Um, we're looking at the impact of the physical building. So we have a, a variety of sensors in the building and we're also getting access to the building data that exists through uh, the developer. Um, and then um, we, we are, um, you know, we hired this manager of cultural sustainability and she keeps a lot of notes. Um, we do a bunch of different surveys, focus groups, photo voice, huge mixed method um, approach to this case study. And then we also um, are recruiting comparison sites um, where we um, you know, wanna, wanna see how, you know, in a pre-post kind of way, um, how things are changing there compared to this uh, intensive case study. 
um, and doing some leadership interviews to learn more about how um, the most successful um, organizations in regard to culture of sustainability, what they're doing. Um, and um, after three years, um, we're gonna try to transfer this into four other building contexts. Um, and that honestly might happen earlier than that because we, we already gotten quite a bit of interest um, to implement this in other contexts. Um, and then eventually we want to develop a business case for this. Um, so that's important. We're trying to estimate what this will cost and if this is a viable thing um, for an organization to invest in or for a building owner to invest in. Um, because one thing that we emphasize is creating a cultural shift uh, cannot be done on the cheap. So um, the question is how much does it cost and what is the return on investment? Um, and um, I'm gonna skip this so that we have some more time uh, for questions, but um, we, we developed a culture of sustainability scale so that we can actually measure quantitatively our um, changes, hopefully, um, and also the comparison across buildings uh, or organizations um, and I'm happy to report that the psychometrics look very good. Um, we used a uh, mixed approach out of uh, more classical measurement theory and then um, item response theory, which has a lot of advantages of looking at items um, much more carefully um, and in detail. Um, yeah, and um, in... Um, yeah, so, so maybe we can have this as a conversation in terms of how this might link to uh, your work within SSBMG and maybe also the FBI. Um, and of course there is many people involved. We have a huge research team of um, really bright people um, that I'm very thankful for. Um, it's, a, it's a very interdisciplinary research that we're doing here. Um, and we have tons of funders and partners. So um, thank you to all of them. Um, and I will end it here and give us um, about 15 minutes for question and discussion. So, so Eric, you, you, you asked the, uh, the question about what is the connection between culture and business models? Would, would you like to take a first stab at answering your question or would anybody else like to offer mm -hmm. a suggestion as to their perspective on that question? I have a couple of thoughts towards this. Maybe I'll take a quick attempt at that. Sorry, is that room? Go ahead. Um, so I was wondering, when you mentioned culture, right, you're, you're embedding it into the organization. That's the, the foundation of it. I just wonder that to me seems similar wording for the business model, right? And, and why we're trying to push the strategic approach and um, how we talk about it. I mean, you can change your lights to LEDs, but what we're trying to do is really get it into the why of your organization, the, the fundamental core of your organization by putting it into your strategy. Do you see um, you need the culture to support being able to create the strategy? In other words, as we're trying to do the business model, we need to also be thinking about how to change the culture or um, you see, I'm trying to think of an alternative to that. I guess you see it enabling it or as part of the transition and all in the together, or how do you see that working? Yeah, I think um, one thing that we have seen um, in the context of, of this research on buildings um, is that when, when we talk to Building like we, we did some research with building owners and tenants and um, management companies, and so when we talk to the to the building owners, um, you know they said we will invest in sustainable buildings um, if the tenants ask for it. Makes sense. And then so then we talk to the tenants and that that you know we are investing in sustainable buildings if it helps us to recruit and retain employees. Um, you know, especially the, the kind of companies that we were talking to, they're looking for the young workforce. And um, in fact, the companies that are, 
that, that moved into the building were mostly motivated um, by that, by attracting um, people, employees to work for them in this cool building. Um, and so I, I, I think if, if, you, if you really want to create true, ch when, when you want to change the organization of business, um, you kind of need to have uh, not just the leadership on board, you need to also have uh, the employees on board and um, often the employees can also push the leadership um, if they feel they're losing their employees um, because they're not um, engaging in sustainability enough um, and that can be a, a, a strong motivator. Um, and so the, I, I think in that sense, um, in, in, an example is, um, there, you know, there were several companies that did not want to move into the building where, before it was built and we were looking for um, anchor tenants um, because they were worried that there would not be enough parking for the employees. Um, and um, so the culture that exists or what the belief system around sustainability among employees are, can very much influence the leadership's decision-making. Um, so I think in, in, in that sense, um, there is a very strong uh, connection. Um, so I think it's both in terms of providing the ground upon which leaders can make decisions around moving towards sustainability, that they feel comfortable moving in that direction, that they feel like they have the support, but then also in terms of um, actually implementing the changes. Um, because you can put this business model in place, but if, let's say, the middle level management is not actually embracing it or implementing it, um, it will have no impact. Um, or very little impact, um, you know, at least in terms of the, the organizational level, maybe in, in, in terms of what they're producing and so on, yes, but um, in, in terms of how they're, how they're operating. Um, so I think from those two angles, um, it is important and that there's a strong connection, but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely willing to be um, proven wrong. <laughs> uh, it's a very interesting question because we haven't tested that in empirical context to that point yet, but we think of the flourishing business model or the business model itself as an interface, a social interface with the customers and the stakeholders who would be participating with, you know, with a firm and its, and its value and its offer to, to um, customers and to a community that it's, that it's embedded in. And so see this, we see this as a type of systemic process for creating um, creating relationship between an organizational culture and the cultures of, of the future culture of, of use of a product or service if that's a new thing and of the relationship with its stakeholders which is developed um, through communications through uh, through economic channels through differences in the way that the organization expresses itself. So it's not that the business model tool does that, but all the engagement in the development of a model that that could represent, a business model that, that these tools can actually represent, have to come together. That probably needs to be clear in the literature. But um, this, is, this has been a real interesting discussion, very interested in, in these topics and we are excited about where this could go. Um, I wanted to um, raise uh, the, an, another question or question that, that I was have with respect to like, where the organizations and the groups that are developing cultures of sustainability live within their larger culture. So how do you, how do you see within perhaps community psychology, Manuel, how uh, these sort of micro cultures or niches could start to change the larger landscape of a national or provincial or a, a larger community culture um, toward, toward sustainability being, being uh, or flourishing, we would say, because sustainability is often thought of as a, a set of practices towards a goal that is kind of a fuzzy goal. We try to make that goal 
clear by talking about sustain, flourishing, sustainability for flourishing. So, but anyway, for with respect to the community. Yeah, it's it's definitely something that um, we are are interested in in um, trying to figure that out. Um, it's, it's it's one of our research questions in a way how how it influences the you know the community close to us, but then also um, beyond that. And um, I, I don't know if that's you know specific to this to, to this building but what we have seen so far I mean, the building has been just occupied for a few months now but um we're giving a lot of tours <laughs> for example um you know to, tomorrow well, thursday i'm giving a tour actually from from all the way uh, a group from milan um and um i Often when I when I uh, talk to people in the community and you know to telling them what I'm doing, I'll, they know about Evolve One already and they're talking about it and so they're saying they had a lot of conversations about it. Um, but I don't know to what degree that is um, you know unique to this to this building because it, it's breaking ground a little bit within the Canadian context. Um, so how that exactly permeates from this you know, organizational context into a broader community. Um, there's another aspect that, we, that we're looking into. Um, and that's, that's the question whether or not um, people who are part of this culture, when they leave the specific context, if they take with them this part of the culture. And we're looking at that in both um, in terms of at an individual level, when they go back to their private home, are, are there things that transferring to the to the private home context? Um, but then also when they leave the company that they're working for and with that the building, um, we're hoping to to follow people um, to new organizations. Um, a lot of the the the, the people who um, you know, leave these organizations, take on leadership positions elsewhere, so they they would have the potential to to be pretty influential. Um, and so, we 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 trying to understand if they're taking the culture with them or not. Um, well, uh, uh, Christakis's uh, social contagion theory might be a good way to look at that as well. As yeah. people move between different uh, communities and contexts, that that they influence others in many different ways, which are which we can measure through positive outcome measures and attribute it to that kind of diaspora of that culture. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. Uh, S Simon Robinson, who is in Brazil, I think you may have a comment or a question. Oh, Simon. You may... Simon. Uh, if he doesn't, I, I will have a <laughs> Simon, you there? Go ahead, Doug. Uh, hi, uh, Manuel. Thanks for this. It was uh, great to see that uh, you're doing this work on culture and because um, it does not happening very much. I've been working in the culture and sustainability world for 20 plus years now, and um, it's a fairly lonely place in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, well, we should connect then. Yes, we should. And <laughs> uh, and we're not too far away. I'm just in Toronto. Okay. Um, and I've published quite a bit in 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 this area as well. And uh, and so it's it's interesting for me to see how you're approaching breaking down um, the the big um, structures of of culture and trying to see them played out through the through the rather micro lens of a building and its inhabitants and, um, and how all the soft uh, dimensions of things which are critical, uh, including values. Um, and I, you mentioned um, uh, numerous times in, there in your presentation about the importance of values. And in, as I've looked at values over the years, I, I've been struck by how values are often 
they can be played out either consciously or unconsciously. And they're, in both cases, they are living values. And um, it's just that they uh, are unconscious. And um, part of the, the sustainability challenge is how um, unconscious um, we are of the impact of not only what we do personally, but the systems that we're part of um, in a larger sense, and how do you change that? So I'm, I'd love to chat more. I just wanted to throw a, a quick little thing. I'm working now with the um, on a sustainability task force the, for the um, American Association for State and Local History. And that's um, working with heritage organizations across the country. Um, the ASLH is looking for a way that they can help foster a sustainability attitude within their heritage sites. And of course, there's a lot of problems with how those heritage sites work because they don't, they're not geared towards the living culture. Um, they're mostly looking at the world through a, a rear view mirror. And um, so how do you actually do that? And so I'm grappling with many of the same kinds of issues that you are, except at a, at, at a more ridiculously large scale, but ultimately they come down to communities and, and how do you manage that? So I'd love to chat more with you about that. Yeah, I would love that. So uh, we're just coming up to the, uh, the end of the meeting uh, and I'll throw in my two cents on this question of the intersection between culture and, and business model, which I've been giving some thought to since uh, we, we first started to uh, uh, engage with Manuel in the fall last year. And I, I think for me, uh, and, and Doug, you'll recognize that this thinking is influenced by the long conversations that you and I have had at OK in the past as well. Um, but, um, you know, if, if, we, if we use this analogy of culture being the soul of the organization, if we're thinking about the business model as the, um, the design of how the business is going to operate and be viable, how, how does the business um, become viable, then, um, if, if we need, if we need, if we're changing the definition of viability, and we're changing, we're saying we need to change uh, people's values so that they value the things that will enable not only the organisation but its wider society and hence its culture to be sustainable. Um, there seems to me to just be a, a massive number of feedback loops between. What will the culture allow people to design and what does the design require in the future that the culture needs? And there seems to me there to be so many feedback loops across, uh, you know, at the individual level, at the, you know, the groups, the departments, the communities within organizations, at the organizational level, uh, the, the organization as community, the communities of which the organization is a part, it's, it's wider value than them. Uh, networks and supply chains, as well as the communities physically that the organization is situated uh, and, and operating in. So it just seems to me that, um, uh, you know, considering a, a 30 year, you know, using a process like backcasting to design a 30 year business model, you're only going to come up with a business model that is future fit if we use that as the definition, as the working definition of, of strong sustainability. Um, then um, the culture is, has to be enable people, has to allow people, has to encourage people to be able to do that work. And once they've done that work, the culture has to be uh, moving in a direction that people are inspired and, and confident to actually try to start to implement that in their next business model, the one that's going to be implemented as part of the near-term strategy on that journey towards that long-term uh, vision. So it, it just seems to me it, it, it's, uh, you know, Perhaps unsurprisingly, culture is going to be everywhere at every scale in everything that we need organizations and leaders and organizations to be doing. So that's my, my kind of first take, of, take on this, not very general, it's not very specific, but um, it, it certainly spurs me on to want to further integrate uh, what we've been doing with a business model design lens with the approaches that Manuel has just started to unpack for us today. So Manuel, I want to, to, to thank you very much. I don't know if you have any response to, to that comment and then maybe we'll, we'll end it at that point. Um, 
No, I, I think that, that that speaks again to to this kind of dual connection with, with, with culture, right? In terms of um, providing the ground on which you can introduce some of these um, changes more at the, at, at the business model or leadership level, um, but then also kind of um, a place where, where, where you need to kind of end up with. Um, yeah, and I think um, maybe an interesting tension to think about, and I don't. And this is a conversation for the future. Is um, one thing about culture that I, I think makes it hard to work with is um, that it's something that emerges, right? It's it's you know I use the blob kind of image there. Um, it, 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 it's, it's not very tangible and it's, um, it's difficult to, 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 to plan, but it's something that you need to foster and um, within um, you know, a, a long-term strategy that a business model is where you know, you're thinking about many years and you're doing the back casting and um yeah so that that might be something to more to think about i mean we don't have time right now but i i think that that might be an interesting ongoing uh conversation um yeah uh, so um thanks very much for, for that response manuel i agree with you there's, there's that's a good area for us to start as any as, as, to, as to how that could work um, so I want to thank Manuel for his presentation today, that, that, and uh, it, it certainly uh, um, did what I was hoping to do. So thank you, Manuel. Um, and um, for having me. Uh, and, and looking forward to um, uh, to how we move uh, move this conversation and, and the the strong sustainable business model group towards the Flourishing Enterprise Institute. How we, how we move that forward over the coming uh, coming weeks and months. Um, and, and if anybody on, on the meeting today is interested in, in getting more involved in that, then uh, please reach out to our animators at animators.ssbmg.com. Uh, Nicole Norris uh, is on the call today, so uh, please please reach out to her and she can link people together, together connect people together as, as we need. Uh, you can also, of course, reach out to Manuel or myself uh, as well if you'd like. Uh, so just a quick note for next month. So next month, uh, our speaker is... Uh, from uh, the University of Nottingham in the UK, although he's uh, at their location in China. Uh, and he's been doing some interesting work around sustainable business models in the Chinese context, as I've understood it, and has come up with some interesting uh, theorization ar around that, which he's gonna be sharing with us next month. Uh, so Oliver Lash is our uh, speaker next month, so we look forward to that. And um, uh, we hope in the months following that to have some uh, significant updates uh, on the strongest uh, on flourishing enterprise innovation toolkit project, including uh, the flourishing enterprise canvas, uh, and uh, specifically on the quick start handbook for that project, and also uh, on a new book chapter for, uh, concerning the flourishing enterprise strategy design method, uh, which uh, is going to be published in May. Uh, so we'll, we'll try and connect those things together over the next uh, few meetings. Uh, we're also still we're also interested in more speakers. So uh, if you've got uh, something. Uh, interesting to talk about uh, related to the streams of research and practice of this project, then uh, please reach out to, uh, to the animators and myself uh, and we can have a conversation about scheduling uh, your presentation into our schedule over the coming weeks and months. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a great evening and thank you again, Manuel. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.